Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Fushi Tokojima, and today I'm very happy to have Professor Alvin E. Roth uh, from Stanford University. Okay, so Al um, is an um, economics professor in Stanford and also a recipient of the uh, 2012 um, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics uh, for his contribution uh, to the uh, field of market design. Um, hi, Al. Thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, I'm happy to talk to you. You didn't mention one of my great accomplishments, which is that you were my student. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So congratulations on having a great student. <laughs> and thanks, thanks again for mentioning this. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so uh, as I already said, I think uh, you are the pioneer of the field of market design. And among many other things, you are pioneered many of the practical implementation of the insights from market design. So would you mind describing some of those uh, practical implementations that uh, you are involved in, please? Well, one of the first ones that I got involved in was was helping to redesign the labor market for American physicians, American doctors. And they, as, as in Japan, they use a centralized clearinghouse to assign new doctors to the hospitals at which they'll have their first jobs. And there were some problems with this in the U.S. One of the problems is uh, uh, there were an increasing number of married couples uh, graduating from medical school, and they needed two jobs, not just one job. And the existing uh, clearinghouse for, for doctors was really better at, at matching single doctors than it was at matching married doctors. But uh, that was something that we were able to adjust. And and in recent years, there have been more than a thousand couples every year, more than 2,000 doctors every year uh, participating as, as married couples. And, and they need two jobs and not just one. And they typically need two jobs that are close together to each other. And that changes the the mathematics of matching, right? The, the A lot of the origin of matching theory goes back to the famous paper of Gale and Shapley in 1962. And they thought pretty well about, about how single people could be matched, but, but married people turn out to be different. And I understand that in Japan, you've studied some uh, variations on, on that problem having to do with distributing doctors, not having them all in Tokyo, uh, but but distributing them around the country. So so as you know, that's a, a you know a hard but but valuable area to think about in market design, how to match people to jobs. Now another thing that I've thought about with my colleagues is matching children to schools. And there are ways in which that's similar to matching doctors to jobs and ways in which it's different. Um, we don't have a problem with married couples being matched to schools, but we do have issues about children who have an older sibling already in some school, uh, trying to make sure that they can go to the same school if their parents want them to, so that the parents will have just one drop off in the morning. Um, but that's a problem that we can handle. Uh, and there are other problems that that are, are difficult, more difficult to handle. We have concerns about uh, ethnic balance in schools. So it goes under the name of affirmative action. We would like to make sure that the schools aren't all one ethnic group or one uh, reading ability, you know, lots of things like that. Uh, so so we've spent some time with different cities in, in the United States thinking about how to help them match children to schools in ways that, that will be efficient and fair. And, and my understanding is that in Japan, you've been thinking a little bit about matching children to uh, daycare. So I imagine there are some similarities with that too. Yeah, exactly. So, oh, wow, this 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 really reminds me of uh, my uh, graduate school days indeed. So oh, I think um, uh, one of my first uh, papers uh, I was working on is indeed about the matching with couples. So it's very hard to uh, uh, match couples in different uh, hostels, right? So actually, you and I, uh, together with uh, Parag Patak, ended up writing a paper on this. So it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, okay. and, and one of the things about that paper is we, we started to suspect from empirical evidence that matching couples might be easier than it looked like in theory. But it wasn't until our paper and then the some follow-up papers that we start that the theory caught up that we started to understand why we were as successful as we had been. So that was a good paper we wrote. <laughs> yep, that's one of my favorite papers, indeed. So actually, uh, as you said, so in Japan also we have. Uh, I'm working on this problem with um, uh, uh, 
putting children to daycares, and it, it's actually really important to actually accommodate siblings there. So looks like we, we have a lot of siblings actually trying to find two places in the same daycare or nearby daycares. And indeed, um, how to actually do it is still a pretty big, uh, big problem uh, in some of the uh, cities that we are uh, working with. So. Okay. Well, so, you know, another thing I've worked on is, is uh, kidney transplants, how to organize them. And uh, these days, I've been thinking hard about deceased donor transplants. But the way, the way my work on kidneys began was thinking about living donor transplants. And that's an issue that might be important in Japan, because Japan doesn't do many deceased donor transplants. It mostly does living donor transplants. But, and, and the reason you can have living donor transplants is that healthy people have two kidneys and, and can remain healthy with one. So they can give a kidney to someone they love who's dying of kidney failure. But, but sometimes it's hard to give a kidney because even though the donor is healthy enough, uh, the kidney isn't a good match. And so kidney exchange is about making sure that, that every patient can get a compatible kidney, a kidney that's a good match, possibly from some other patient's donor. So, um, so I think it increases the effectiveness of, of living donor uh, transplantation. And that's something that, that you do a lot of in Japan. So, so I, I hope to see kidney exchange in Japan sometime too. <laughs> I completely agree. Indeed, um, what do you think is a um, challenge for us, uh, those in Japan, um, for actually establishing uh, the kidney exchange? Well, so one of the things that surgeons can do, and I think they do a lot of in Japan, is what's called desensitization. So if a hospital is trying to transplant a kidney into someone and the kidney isn't a very good fit, they can work hard to make to, to make it fit better. But that, that tends to not be as good for the patient as getting a compatible kidney. But it doesn't require hospitals to coordinate with each other. So there's a certain sense in which it's medically more complex and not as satisfactory for the patient, but it's bureaucratically simpler than kidney exchange. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why kidney exchange hasn't yet caught on in Japan is because there's this other way of dealing with the problem um, that isn't quite as good, but is is, is simpler to carry out if you don't have the help of market designers to help you overcome the coordination difficulties of of exchanging among patients. That's so that's where market designers could help. <laughs> that really reminds me of uh, around 2005. I think I was uh, your student around that time, and you were actually about to establish the uh, kidney exchange in the U.S., right? So I'm pretty sure that you also had a lot of um, like uh, challenges and so on. So I wonder how how you actually established uh, 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 this kidney exchange. And it, it's a big, big, big system now in the US, I understand. Well, we talked a lot to our surgical colleagues and we listened carefully to their problems and, and they had a lot of problems. So originally we just started kidney exchange in the US with exchange between just two pairs. So a patient donor pair that was incompatible would give a kidney to another pair that could give the kidney, their donor's kidney back. Uh, but that's that's relatively simple kind of kidney exchange, but it it doesn't scale so well for for a big country. Uh, so we had to learn how to do bigger exchanges and and incorporate exchanges that would help hard to match patients. And that often involves coordination between hospitals, right? Some of the patient donor pairs are at different hospitals from each other. And that was, I think, one of the main obstacles to getting things going. But, but over time, you know, we started in New England where there are 14 transplant centers and they would exchange among themselves. And now it's a national program. And there's also a kidney exchange in quite a, you know, quite a bit of kidney exchange, not, not as much as in the U.S., in Europe. Uh, Britain and the Netherlands both have active kidney exchange. So, um, and, and Japan, you know, is a big country that does not so many transplants per million population, but nevertheless, a lot of transplants. So I think that, that it's a place where kidney exchange could be very helpful. It's a wonderful message. Thank you so much. So uh, actually, I prepared the second question, but you actually almost answered my next question, actually. But let me, let me go anyway. Um, so, um, so how did your effort in implementing market design insights into practice uh, actually improve uh, 
people's lives and help the society? Could you sort of focus on that question? Well, so kidney transplants are an easy one to answer that. I mean, we, we've we done several thousand more kidney transplants than we would have done without kidney exchange. Uh, so so that's a good thing. That that saves lives. It makes, makes deceased donor kidneys available for other patients who need them and who don't have a living donor. Um, so it has lots of good effects on, on health. Um, school choice is, is harder to measure, but, you know, getting your kid into a good school is one of the ways you can deal with the city when you're a parent. You know, one of the things you have to do is make sure your children are, are settled in schools that are good for them. And having a good choice mechanism that allows families to express their preferences um, gets a lot more children into schools that they want to be in than, than the previous systems did. So I think there's a lot of good that comes from that. And of course, that's many, many children, you know, in uh, New York City has a, you know, more than a million children in its public schools. Uh, so, so every year, a lot of them have to be matched to new schools as they, as they get older. Um, and of course, markets in general, you know, one of the labor markets I've worked in, you know, not just markets for doctors, I've, I've worked on the market for new economists. And um, I forget when you went on the market, did we already have signals? Or, or... It was a, I, I think it was the first year, actually. Okay. So, you know, you got a good job. Uh, one of the things to do is, is to help people get good jobs, jobs that they are well matched for. And um, because because it's now become so easy for people to apply for jobs, many jobs get lots and lots of applications and they have to choose which ones to follow up on. And so what we developed was preference signaling so that people can can signal not just how good they are, but how interested they are in a job. And I think that's helped coordinate a lot of uh, job markets. It's happening now in the medical labor markets in the United States. Uh, we're seeing signaling being introduced differently by different specialties. Um, so I think that that helps a lot of people get better jobs than they could otherwise. And that's a, an improvement in welfare. Oh, I see. Actually, uh, this signaling in the medical match is new to me, actually. So well, I remember that you actually worked as a board of an MP recently, right? Is that you are doing? No, no. I mean, it's it's the economists doing. They know about, the, you know, they, they, they cite our economics papers about signaling, but each medical specialty has done it differently. So you might recall that in economics, we allow people to to make two signals of interest. So the signals are are very special, you know, powerful signals of interest. But different medical specialties do it differently. So some medical specialties in the United States allow a small number of signals, as we do in economics. But there are at least two medical specialties that encourage people to send 30 signals. Now, when you send 30 signals, that's a lot. And so that becomes, that starts to act like a soft cap on applications, because if if you don't send a signal to someplace, maybe they won't interview at all because you had 30 signals and you didn't even send them one. So th this is early days. We're going we're gonna to learn a lot about signaling by watching the, the medical labor markets. I see. When you introduced the uh, economy signaling, I... I remember that uh, one of the big issues was actually how many signals to send. And uh, if you have too many, that's not all that informative, if, but you need a few, uh, a few of them. So it's, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen um, in, in the coming years in uh, medical match. Yeah. No, and I think the specialties that have 30 signals, failing to send someone a signal is a negative signal. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I see. Wow. So I'm really happy to know all, all, all these things, so some of the new things. And uh, well, um, so um, that's actually next, uh, come, uh, before we move to the next question. So uh, I was I actually wanted to uh, hear about uh, uh, sort of recent developments in market design. Um, so frontier, so to speak. So you already touched on some of them in the medical match and the killing, I think. But uh, I'm really interested in what is a sort of a cutting edge things uh, in the practical implementation of market design and what are the promising areas and what are the challenges uh, and so on? Well, I think one of the big matching markets in the world that isn't working very well at all is refugee resettlement and more generally resettling migrants. So at the United States southern border, we we you know have a big political issue. There's a uh, presidential election coming up uh, where people will talk about immigration. In Europe, of course, they have uh, lots of troubles with immigration, you know, some of it in small boats across the Mediterranean. Uh, 
So it's a matching market in the sense that people want to resettle, uh, but they can't just choose where they go. They have to be granted asylum or or given a visa or admitted. Uh, and countries would like to regulate their borders, but that's also hard to do. So so countries have irregular and, and illegal immigration. And the question is how to organize immigration so that it's more orderly, that it gives people a chance of of improving their life by by moving where they live but but doesn't cause them to put their families in small boats in the mediterranean and and risk their lives uh you know there's a sense in which we'll we'll know we're handling immigration well when when immigrants arrive on airplanes so that's uh the question is how to how to get from where we are to that that's a uh, going to be a big question in in uh, market design for for your generation <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a great message to me <laughs> and my generation. So actually, uh, I remember that the one of the uh, major uh, resettlement agency in the United States actually uses certain matching algorithm uh, in order to like do the better job in placing. Right. So that's the HIAS, yeah. H-I-A-S. Yeah. Those initials used to stand for Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, but now they're just an international society. You know, the the oh. flood of of Jewish refugees has has slowed, but there are lots of other refugees around the world, and and the Hias tries to help them. And it, in particular, where they're using an algorithm is in the resettlement of refugees who have been granted asylum in the United States. Where should they go? You know, how should they be matched with communities? And Alex Tatelboim is is one of the scholars who's associated with working with them on that. This, yeah, this example is very uh, interesting. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I always wanted to do a little more uh, myself. And, uh, yeah, I'm really glad to learn that um, you also see this to be a frontier. So, th that's great. So, um, I now realize that, well, um, um, uh, I have almost used up your time, <laughs> um, but then just give me one more uh, second. So I'd like to ask the last question. So, <laughs> um, so in our project, so we are inviting people and organizations and both inside and outside of academia, uh, so that they can collaborate with us on market design implementation projects. So, uh, could you give a message to those those who are interested in or considering joining those uh, implementation projects with us? Well, you know, market design is a great part of economics for students to think about because because um, there's always something happening. You know, so so one way to become a a PhD in economics is to read lots of papers in economics journals and then write a follow up to them. But another way is to read the newspaper and talk to people who are involved in markets and find out what the difficulties are in, in the various markets that that uh, that people are having trouble with and seeing if you can help fix them. So so for students, I think market design is a, a, a great uh, field to think about. And for people who are having difficulty organizing their markets, it turns out that e economists know something about rules of the game. You know, game theory became the, the basis of economic theory in the last 40 or 50 years. And game theory is a great tool for, for thinking about design because a lot of the design of markets is about rules, rules, regulations, how things should proceed. Other parts are about infrastructure, you know, what, what physical infrastructure you need to run a market, things like that. But um, but I think there's there's uh, great promise in the in in collaboration between economists and and people who are having difficulty organizing their markets. Thank you so much. So this is a really great message. So well, um, I want to thank you, and I actually want to also say that well, um, we we would like to really follow your footsteps and well make a progress in the market design, uh, both in theory and practice. So oh. Oh yeah. Um, uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, it's thank exciting. You. To, it's exciting to see all the market design that's starting to blossom in Japan. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah. So uh, I hope you will. Uh, yeah. I I hope that I have something to uh, uh, like brag uh, uh, brag about next time I see you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, looking forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.